for preaching. At the moment, what is wanted is the comforting to help the people over the shock. But following that the that need, there has to be a prophetic note to awaken the people. I believe that the vision that we have in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 1 through 28 did exactly that. It was a moment for the people to be comforted, but it was also a moment for the people to be awakened from their slumber. And that is why Ezekiel was given uh, this message. It was both a comfort by those who were sitting by River Kebar, that what God was still with his people, that God was still speaking to his prophet. Yet at the same time, there was a great warning in the message, a great note for the people to awaken and to follow their God again and to repent for the glory of God had departed. It was also a warning that God was coming to make judgment upon the nations, in particular the nation of Israel. He had already departed from the Jews from Judah. He had already deported some Jews from Judah. From the city of Jerusalem, in the first deportation, Daniel went with that. During the second deportation, we see Ezekiel sitting by River Kebar, having been deported. And the third deportation of the third deportation came with the destruction and the ransacking of the whole city of Jerusalem that was burnt down and destroyed completely. So the call of God through this vision to the prophet Ezekiel is, wake up. I am with you. I will not leave you. My glory has departed, but you must awaken. You must repent of your sin or else there will be trouble. The context of this great prophecy was a time of great change. Individual lives were being shattered. There was a sudden catastrophe that had come into the homes and they were broken. Rich people, the poor, the aristocracy, the politicians, were all lifted from the comfort of their homes, from all their riches, from all their influence, from all their wealth and affluence, and they were all taken to the land of Babylon and placed in this concentration camp where we find the servant of God sitting. It was a time of despair because they were away from the temple of God. We read in Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept as we remembered Zion. They despaired, they were away from God's city of Zion. They were away from the temple, the visible place where God's glory dwelt. It was a time of great change, a time of great despair. Because the primary theme of this great prophecy is the departure of the glory of God from Judah. We live in a world that is ravaged with a great suffering. We live in a world that is ravaged right now and broken right now into a great despair because of coronavirus. I believe the need of the hour is exactly what the need was during Ezekiel's days. That is, they needed a fresh vision of God. We also need a fresh vision of our God. If you were to draw the picture of that great prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 1, you will have to give the cherubim four faces. Each of a lion, each of an ox, each of an eagle and each of a man. That will give you an idea of what 
we are reading or we are talking about friends this is a complicated passage of scripture but the point is the point is that we are faced tonight with a vision of the glory of God that is what is displayed in this passage right here as we read these words and they are complicated they are so complicated we can see right away that they defy the capacity of human speech for description whatever Ezekiel saw as he tried to put pen to paper and to put in it into words that men and women could understand it falls short of the actual thing that Ezekiel saw we must remember that as we read these words this is not what actually he saw. This is what he tried to put down as a human being called from a difficult message that the Lord was trying to communicate with him. Nevertheless, his responsibility was to write it down. The message must be conveyed. People must be told. The Holy Spirit of God must work. God must deliver his message. We can never fully understand what this man saw. But the only way we can share is to try and read what the Bible says. And I'll be taking you there slowly. So Ezekiel begins by the river Kebar or Sheba. He is sitting beside that river and he sees a physical storm coming toward him from the north. Daniel is captured. He is not alone. But the Lord shows him a physical storm coming from the north. With that storm are clouds and there are flashes of lightning. But as he watches that storm approaching him, it is as if that storm is opened up like curtains on a stage. Suddenly, drawn back to reveal a heavenly scene before him. Beyond those immediate curtains of earthly reality, the prophet Ezekiel is taken into a supernatural realm where he sees a vision of the chariot of God's glory. It seems that he sees this chariot as God rides triumphantly and irresistibly through all the eras of time. You can see that he saw four living creatures. They are described as the cherubim or as cherubim. You can see that they are connected with the chariot, yet they are individually distinct from it. They are not part of the chariot, but they are connected to it. Above all of that, you can see that there is a throne. You can't see who is on the throne because there is a cloud. But the word of God tells us there is a man sitting on the throne. I want you to turn with me to verse 4 of Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4. The Bible says, Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north. Great, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself. And the brightness was all around it and radiating out of the mid in its midst like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. So the first thing we see or the first thing that Ezekiel saw was the whirlwind. The will, a whirlwind coming from the north. I want you to look at it. A whirlwind came out of the north. Now, that is speaking of judgment. Judgment coming upon Jerusalem. Because Babylon, those who have captivated them and have taken them to their empire, they came from the north. The people who came and took the, captive, the, 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 the children of Israel captive these people came 
to this nation of Israel, to the, the people of Judah, they came from the north. The empire of Babylon, right down into, rode down into Jerusalem and destroyed it. He came from the north. So the north there speaks of the Babylonian empire coming into Jerusalem and taking them into captive, coming with great destruction. Uh -huh. But within the word of God, the direction of north is also a type, and I want you to follow, of a sign, if you like, of the throne and the presence of God. The destruction and the judgment and the captivity is coming from Babylon, which is coming from the north, but also this is a sign that the throne and the presence of God, they come from the north. You can see that in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14 and verse 13, when he describes the fall of Satan and the motivation that Satan wanted to exalt himself to the sides of the north. Satan wanted to exalt himself from the sides of the north to the presence of God. So what did Lucifer want to become? He wanted to become like God. To exalt himself to the throne of God. To the sides of the north. That is the general direction that the Old Testament people of God understood as the place where God was. Northward. It is the idea of heavenward. That he will look towards God, towards heaven. That idea according to the Jewish economy, according to the Hebrew people, they believed that the Lord dwelled high at the north. And when Satan wants to exalt himself and bring his seat, he brings it high up. He wants to bring it high up to the north. And the judgment is coming from the north. But as Ezekiel is seeing, the judgment is coming also from the north, from the presence of God. Meaning, it is God who is sending this judgment from the north through the Babylonians who are coming from the north also. I want to challenge you that that is the direction that the people of God ought to have their sights directed and focused to. In other words, God is in heaven. He dwells up yonder. That is our direction. That is where we are supposed to lift our eyes to and cry to. But many times, Many times, we have depended on our technology and the innovations. We have come to think so proudly that because we have science, that because we have innovation, that because we have laboratories, that because we have technology, that because our hospitals are well equipped, that because we have money, that because we are dwelling in a land so rich and a land so able, we can be able to deal and take care of our situations. The Lord is still telling us, help comes from up north, from his presence. Hallelujah. Amen. There are two things. You have the judgment of the Babylonians coming from the north, and you have the direction of the throne of God in the north. To the Jewish mind, these seems to contradict each other. But that is not the case. It is the exact opposite. For what God's Spirit is saying through this vision is, you believe that my throne is to the north. The Babylonians are coming to you from the north. And the interpretation is, I am the one who is sending the Babylonians. Do you see that, my dear brothers? I am the one who is visiting this judgment upon you, you Israelites. 
because you have rejected me, because you have run away from me, because you have sat and comforted yourself and thought you can manage it, I am coming to you from the north with my judgment. There is a whirlwind indicating a tremendous movement from the throne of God. What is that movement? It is the judgment of God. If you look at verse 4, you see that there is a fire as well. A light that is brighter than the sun, perhaps like an atomic blast, incandescent, heat and light. There in the midst of that whirlwind, there is a great fire. Why? Because God is a consuming fire. Our God is light. Remember, at Paul's conversion, there was a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun. You have a willowing, you have a great judgment, you have a great heat and a great light. And all of these things are speaking to us and they are telling us about the unapproachable presence of our God. From the north, the Jews is a place of mystery. But it's also a place of darkness. A place, a direction from where distress is coming. It is also a place of judgment. There, from the north comes Judah's enemies toward them by the hand of God. Influenced and directed towards them by God himself. We are right away shown God's glory as the glory of a judge. Ezekiel's eye is not just from what he saw, but, but from what he had. Because he had the will win. Seven, several times he tries to describe the sound that accompanied the vision. He says, look at the passage. That it was the voice of the Almighty. That is all he could describe. The voice of El Shaddai. I want you to follow me. Please don't, don't, let me not lose you even as we try to understand this passage because I believe this is the message that the Lord gave me. If you go to Psalm 104, verse 3 and 7, you will read these words. God is the one who laid the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who rideth upon the wings of the wind, and thy rebuke they fled, at the voice of thy thunder, they hasted away. God is described as the one who rided upon the wings of the wind. The word riding is the same word that we find in Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. Where God is described as walking in the cool of the day when Adam and Eve had eaten that fruit. God walked in the pool of the day. That walking was not a walking of pleasure. That walking was not a good walking. God was riding in the wind of judgment. He was coming to the garden of Eden to see what they had done. He was coming to expel them because they had transgressed. That was the noise. The same noise that Adam heard when God was coming after they had eaten the fruit. And he began hiding himself. This is the same noise that Ezekiel hears from the whirlwind. This noise is the same that accompanied the visions of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. The vision of, Revelation, uh, of John in Revelation chapter 1. And indeed we know that it is the noise that will accompany the Lord Jesus Christ when he finally comes and returns the second time. He will come with the voice of a whirlwind to judge and to destroy. Not only to judge and to, the, to destroy, but to also reassure and save those who have been waiting for him. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So friends, we have seen a fiery wind from the north. Speaking of judgment, speaking of their enemies, and speaking of a God who will come 
in his unapproachable presence and holiness and righteousness as a consuming fire to his own people. That is the first point that we see. A God who is coming in judgment to destroy his enemies, to destroy those who have refused to listen to him, to destroy those who have ignored his warnings, to destroy those who have broken his judgment. He is coming. He is approaching his people in his holiness, in his righteousness, like a consuming fire. But secondly, secondly, don't forget first it's a whirlwind. But secondly, there is a cherubim, cherubim, the cherubim. The cherubim we read, you could see, and they could move in all directions without turning at all. <laughs> Let's read Verse 6, each one had four faces, each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of a burnished bronze. Their hands of a man were under the wings on their four sides, and each of the four had faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn. They went, but each went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. You can continue reading. But the cherubim, we read, you could, you could see that they could move in all directions without turning at all. I don't know what kind of creature is that that Ezekiel saw. He saw them all in those wings, all in those faces, all in those, uh, 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 that picture that he saw, they are all moving. They are all moving in one direction. Others are moving in this direction. And whichever direction is looking, they are all moving, but they are not turning at all. That is important. They could move and see without turning. They are moving and seeing without turning. They could move quickly to accomplish God's will. They had four faces. They could see in all directions of the compass. I believe they also convey to us God's sovereign, glorious rule over his creation. These wings, these cherubims, they are conveying to us that ultimately it is God who rules his creation. Not us. Not our power. Not our money. Not America. It is God who rules. Think of a man. The face of a man. Speaking of God's intelligence. Man is the highest of God's creatures. And indeed God put him in charge of the whole creation. So there you have it. God's intelligence but at the same time, God rules over all men. I do not know if you are seeing what I am seeing. You know, man has become so rude. Man has become so complicated. Man has become, he, he thinks so highly of himself to an extent where you wonder, does man 